You are listening to the Crazy Town Podcast, Interview Anthologies, Volume 2, with Dr. Raymond Youngblood Jr. TNT. Yes. Oh, shit. What? Yes. <laughs> wow. That was what happened almost there. Deep throated my mic there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is uh, our interview anthologies. It's uh, this interview is split up over three episodes because he and I and you. We talked a lot to him about all sorts of topics. So Very good stories. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to get right into it. It's all the interview in one place. Enjoy the show, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Crazy Town Podcast. This is the Interview Anthologies Volume 2. I am your host, Jonas, and I'm here with... TNT Dynamite! The explosive one, TNT D-I-N-O, M-I-G-H-T. I'm doing too many songs now. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Too many songs? No, no, I did too many songs. It's too yeah. much. It's like I go into one song and then... Yeah, you're just doing all the songs. I'm sorry. So, uh, today's episode of the Interview Anthologies is all of the Dr. Youngblood interviews put together. This guy had so many good stories. He's a yeah. Paramount chief, which if you don't know what that is, it'll be in the interview soon. He's an international gold miner. He talks about his basketball skills. <laughs> What else? I mean, all sorts of shit, man. This is like two hours, all there's, in one spot. There's been a lot that has occurred since these interviews, and I'm back to being on the fence. <laughs> you're back, you're back I'm on. back on the fence. I was, I was, like, during the interview, I, you'll see. You'll see. Yeah, yeah, you'll see. I'm on the fence again. All right. Well, make sure you follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash crazy town media, YouTube channel with all of our gaming and everything else on there, all the videos, crazy town media. Subscribe. And Twitter, at Crazy Town Media. But we're going to go get right into this interview, and then we'll be back at the end to discuss. Where am I? All right, everyone. And joining us now on the podcast is Dr. Youngblood. He is a international gold miner. So I want to go ahead and welcome him to the show. Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Do you want to go ahead and uh, tell everybody a little bit, um, kind of like a brief overview, kind of what you do, and kind of tell them if, where they can find you online, things like that? Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Raymond Youngblood Jr. I'm a award-winning international gold miner based out of West Africa. We operate primarily out of the countries of Liberia, Ghana, Sudan, Ghana, uh, Sudan, Colombia. And uh, missing one here, Uganda. Awesome. And that's awesome. primarily what we do. We extract things like precious minerals like gold, diamonds, and rare earth elements. Okay. And then where can they find you online, like on Twitter or if you have a website or anything like that? Yeah, Twitter is at Dr. Youngblood. Uh, Facebook is just my uh, plain name, Raymond Youngblood Jr. And website is www.youngbloodindustries.com. And what else I have here? Uh, pretty much you can find me at Dr. Raymond Youngblood Jr., pretty much anything online. Okay, awesome, awesome. So I guess the first question I had for you, I saw in your Twitter bio, like where you give a little brief description of yourself, it says Paramount Chief, and in parentheses it says King. I'm not sure what, like, can you explain what that is yeah. a little bit for people? Yes. Okay, in, in Africa or most countries outside of North America or Western world, the reference to a paramount chief is identical to what we refer to here in the U.S. as a king. In 2013, sorry, 2000, February of 2012, I was bestowed as a paramount chief. And what a paramount chief basically is, is, is a person almost like a, in some instances, like a president over a traditional group of people, a traditional leader who, who resides over a certain group of people. And my, and my chiefdom, which is normally referred to in the Western world as a kingdom. But in my chiefdom, is about 280,000 people. Land mass-wise is probably roughly around 800,000 acres. 
So 280,000 people will be referred to as my villagers, is people that, like that I monarchy? reside over. Is that and a monarchy? Yeah. It's, 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 similar, it's similar to a monarchy, but... You know, back back way back when, when the British and the Spanish, Spanish and the Portuguese and all those colonized Africa, Spain already had a king, Britain already had a king. So, and when they met the Africans, they also had kings. So, when they basically ruled over Africa, they changed the African status from king to paramount chief, which is identical. So it, uh, you would identify a paramount chief as the same as a king. But in the Western world, we normally don't use paramount chief except with the native Indians. And then uh, in uh, in Africa, this is also referred to as paramount chief or king. Okay, that's uh, wow, that's awesome. Where, what areas? What area is your kingdom? Like where? Where at? Like what would be included in that geography wise? Okay, my area where where I was bestowed is Liberia, West Africa. My county, Liberia, is broken up into counties, like the United States is broken up into states, mm -hmm. and then the states are broken up into parishes, I mean, par uh, uh, counties. I mean, Louisiana, so we normally say parishes. But in Liberia, when uh, sometime around 1847, Liberia became an independent nation, and then it also divided its country into counties. So my county is referred to as, as uh, Barpolu, spelled with a G. The G is silent. G B A R P O L U, Barpolu. So Barpolu County, and then my area where my chieftaincy reign uh, more supreme than anywhere else is an area called Bopolu. Is there so, a G in that one? And that's too? in West Africa. And that. Say again. I said, is there a silent no, G no, in that Bopolu, one? No, Bopolu. No, 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 not in Bopolu. Okay. Okay. So now, it's just like Bob now, are you all, the, originally I, from the, the United States then, or for, are you from that area? No, I'm originally from Louisiana, born and raised country boy here in Louisiana. Um, none of my parents, I, I, my parents probably wouldn't even know where Liberia was, <laughs> but um, I worked over there for 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 quite a long time. And there, there is, let me give you this little bit of history because this, this can also help people understand because me being an American and being a paramount chief in Africa can kind of confuse people because it's not common for an outsider to be, to actually be bestowed. To get an honorary title, they do it all the time, but to actually be bestowed is, is quite, um, a remarkable thing that I am starting to kind of, on a, uh, to start to appreciate. What happened is when you go to an area and you serve the people, as what they can say, there's three ways a, a chief is bestowed or, or a chief is crowned. The first way you're born into it, your dad and your dad, his dad, and so on and so on was a chief, and then you are automatically born into it. The most prestigious way that's, that is now becoming very popular is when they say bestowed, meaning that the uh, people the people select you, the people go, come together, and then... They say, okay, we want you to serve as the leader over us. It's not, it's not even necessarily a vote. It's, it's a, it's a community thing that comes together. You know, you're normally thrown out there with other people. And then out of that group, that's when the, the, the people have to all agree on this person or that person. There is no vote divided in between, nothing like that. Either we all agree on this person or we don't. And then the other way is a person is elected. Because the chiefs are broken up into categories. There is the overall board that governs the chiefs, which is a, a leadership structure, which is called the Traditional Council of Chiefs and Elders. And that Traditional Council of Chiefs and Elders override all the traditional people and is also recognized by the central government, which has, which has its own autonomous government structure away from the central government. And I also sit on that board. And then there is a structure with, which is what is called the Dakpana. The Dakpana is basically like the chiefs of chief or the king of kings. And that's normally a title given to one or more uh, uh, chiefs that, that currently resides. But normally it's just given to one. And then there's the queen mother, which is the, the traditional queen, which also resides. So the Dakpana... Oh, God, I'm going to be in trouble for, man, I hope nobody hears this interview now. 
I cannot remember his name. But <laughs> they're they're going to hear it. They're going to hear from, it. He's from uh, oh, the Queen. I can I know her well because she always called me and get on my butt. Um, uh, and sorry, fellas, I, I just realized something. You probably won't hear me cuss from this point forward because I, I've also told the audience and recognized as a Paramount Chief, and it goes against all my principles to you for me to use foul language, not to, for me to hear it, but for me to use it. So um, the queen is Julie Indy, or also known as Ambassador Julie Indy. She's based out of Liberia, West Africa. And then the chiefs come down in the order, Paramount Chief, Clan Chief, Town Chief, Sub chief, village chief, uh, and then the elders. Normally oh there's God. women leaders and youth leaders and so on and so forth. So over my reign, man, there's a lot of chiefs. What, what, what are you, what are you in total, charge of? Total par- Necessarily. Like, what, what are your you're, duties you're, entail? Whew. Okay. Um, I, your duties really entail, just imagine whatever the president of a country does, that's basically what the what the chief does. And the chief has just remember before there was the central government's uh status that was given to all these countries, it was the traditional status that these countries were ruled by by the kind of a monarchy structure. Whether you have the Ashanti Kingdom or the Mali Kingdom or the Zulu Nation or whatever, it had that it had that structure to it. So it what 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 are those? Again. What are those? The Mali. Okay, the Shunt, oh man. Mali, the Mali Kingdom. You know, way back when uh I'll give you a little bit of history lesson here. They that was that that's what governed Africa. Those were the most powerful nations in the world or the most powerful sections of the world. The Ashanti, you know you know Zulu. Yeah, if I say the name Shaka Zulu, that name will ring a bell, right? Yeah, yeah I've, heard, I've, heard of, I've heard of the Zulu nation before. Oh okay. Well, these were these were just basically uh, like, like the Egyptians. Let me just go a little bit uh, more. Like the Egyptians, these are these were nations that were just in power, and so that same structure that that governed that or that whole thing that you can see is is exactly what it was. So, uh, balance a paramount chief with a president, or if you want to g- give a little bit of smaller title to it, just, just say the paramount chief is the same as the governor, or you know, some of the leaders within the traditional leadership can be like the Senate, can be like the House of Representatives, the elders, you know, reign where there's a group of people who takes care of this. And then there's the ministers or the department heads. And, and every chieftaincy has that. So, you know, I have somebody that's over security. I have somebody that's over education. I have somebody that's over uh, health. I have somebody that's over the youth and sports. I have somebody that, you know, it just it keeps going and keeps going. Now these areas are they are they are they very developed or are they more like small villages or is it you know like a normal size you know city with buildings and uh, tr- you know infrastructure and all that or is it more like tribal and you know smaller scale sort of thing? Yes. Okay. And most ninety percent of them will probably be back way back when though no, they were fully developed. They were fully developed. They had an entire structure, engineering, cities, buildings, all that. And then war and time, they've been reduced basically down to kind of a village structure. Like in my case, we have, we have a city. I mean, you know, you have streets, you have, you have lights, you have generators that power this stuff. You have uh, buildings, one story, two story. You have that. Now, when you're talking about really develop, it will have to be a paramount chief like, uh, like the one in Ghana. The country of Ghana and West Africa, and Ghana has an area or a near a uh, city called Kamasi, which is governed by the what is called, for example, in Liberia, the chief is called the uh, the Dakpana, but in Ghana they're called the Ahenti or the Ashanti, so from the Ashanti nation, and that king that governs them, I mean, he has a entire city with skyscrapers and, and you know and everything, you know, so. Um, it, it, but in, in the most part, it's just basically a village life. And then people like myself, when we are bestowed, we're expected to change all that. We're expected to modernize and bring, you know, certain development to the village and certain, uh, structure and, uh, you know, that kind of thing to modernize it, to take uh, it back to, to the kind of life they once had, where they had this kind of. Uh, how'd you do at that? I said, how'd you do at that? Did you, uh, 
Did you bring him to the 21st century? Well, I, I was just I, in in a relative term of the chief. I was just bestowed. It hasn't been that long, um, so I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And oh, just my recently. biggest plight has been, yeah, 2012, 2013. Okay. okay. So I haven't been a chief that long. Mm-hmm. Now, is this something you do remotely from Louisiana, or do, like how do you split your time as far as all that goes? Cool. Yeah, it's hard, man. And it's hard. Um, for the most part, I spend a great deal of time in Africa, Liberia, and I spend, I'll be spending a lot more time in between Colombia, South America, and West Africa. And then I'll be spending probably about one tenth of my time in East Africa. We have a project that's being developed over there between Uganda and Sudan. But it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, you have a lot of, you have a lot of problems in the villages. For example, a chief, I mean, as a chief, I'm responsible for being over everything from a dispute between a, two farmers over a chicken and a guinea fowl or, and an ear of corn to murder and rape. I mean, you have oh, wow. all these things that as a chief, you're responsible for keeping the law in order, development, and probably my three biggest problems that, that we're facing now is political cor- corruption. That's one of yeah. our biggest things because the, the cities and the towns where most of the politicians live now in the urban areas where you can have, I mean, you literally have some places in Africa that's just as developed as uh, uh, Chicago or New York. I mean, they have skyscrapers, they have streets. You have guys riding around in Bugattis and and Mm Mercedes-Benzes and have private jets. And then you have have the, the complete opposite of that, look like a Tarzan movie, you know, about 10 miles outside the city. So, for me, corruption is one of my biggest plights that I'm having to deal with. Another big problem that I'm having is, is, uh, that I will put to the top three is, is, uh, education and youth development, especially when it comes to young girls and making sure they have what they need. And then the third biggest problem w- would be development, would be modernizing, would be creating jobs you know, streets and, and buildings and modernized hospitals and, you know, this kind of thing. So you have, you literally have people in the bush right now that's doing surgery by candlelight, literally. Oh, wow. And I know this for a fact because I've held the candle before while, while somebody did surgery. Wow. Now you spoke about the women needing development. Now, you know, in the U.S., you know, women's rights have come a long way from, you know, the, in the last hundred years, you know, they went from not even being able to vote to like now they're, you know, they get their equal pay, you know, everything like that. Is is it like that in Africa or, or are the women held to a lesser standard still? So that's why you're fighting to get them education and in, in a place where they can, you know, help the community more, or is it pretty much evened out like it is here? Well, it is, it is pretty, it is, here in America, the women probably are far more advanced than what, where they are there. There is, there you, you have a male chauvinist kind of atmosphere that is extremely strong. I mean, women are just not expected to be able to do what a man does. And it, it has been a very big fight for a lot of women, especially in the area of politics, to get equal representation, to be able to pass laws that even help women. I'll give you one example uh, that is probably one of the biggest places that you can have. If you go to, say, a country like Sudan, like Sudan um, no, let me give a better example. Let's, let's take Liberia. That's, that's my base. I, I know I know Liberia like the back of my hand. If you take a country like Liberia, where probably 30% of the politicians are women, 70% are men, but 52% of the population is female. And 52 like out, of, out of the 80 to 70, say again. <laughs> it sounds like my type of place. 52% female. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, not, not to get off the subject a little bit, but I tell you what, uh, yeah. once, you, once you get a hold of some of them Liberian girls, you're not going to want to come back. I can tell you that. They, they are extremely beautiful. You're not allowed to talk like that, man. You have, you I'm have. allowed to talk like that, man. I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not allowed to use profanity while explaining it. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. That makes sense. But, uh, 
We, yeah. we, we can talk about librarians. Well, everybody, yeah, go ahead, T. I hear you. I said we can talk more about librarian women after the show if you want. <laughs> oh. You can give me a couple <laughs> couple phone numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's one of the that's one of the biggest plights is women in politics, young girls, jobs, you know, just the guys having the understanding and belief that the women can do it. And you know, it it has been it has been a struggle. It has been a real big struggle. I feel bad for a lot of women there, mainly because mainly because of that male chauvinist kind of uh, atmosphere. It's it's slowly changing. But, you know, we still have a long way to go. And Liberia has the very first elected female president in African history. Oh, awesome. And on the whole continent. So, yeah, so that that's, a, you know, that's a big They're ahead of us. And then, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, 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 very much so, very much so. We did a story on the podcast uh, last season of a uh, of a woman who who be, who she pretended to be a man so she could go mine in Tanzania to you know because they wouldn't even allow women in the mine so she like pretended to be a man to even be able to get the job because she was like fleeing her home area and you know so it, it, I know what you when you speak how the women are kind of held back it's chauvinistic they don't even assume they can do the job it kind of that kind of that popped in my head because we had talked about that previously okay and may, maybe for her because uh, that, there's a, there's a couple of ways women are not allowed on the mining site so there's a lot of women that are mining because even in my early days when I, I was out there with the pickaxe and the shovel before we, you know, before we grew into a bit of a modernized mining operation, women, women wasn't allowed on a mining site because it, it feared of the fear of kind of like a, how can I say, like a witchcraft, kind of like a juju, hoodoo, voodoo kind of. Oh, like they were uh, bad luck, like having a woman on the site would be bad luck for the site. Yeah, yeah, it'd be very much bad luck on the site because that's not the kind of work that they, that they believe women should be doing, and it's very physical intensive. The other reason for that too is that uh, there's a very big that the Africans have not settled well with any form of lesbianism or homosexuality or or you know no, women yeah. and the men world don't mix. Yeah. So it, 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 yeah, but yeah, you know, on my mining site you have women, you know, mainly because I'm the boss. But in some mining sites, I've uh, showed up with female staff, and the female staff when they when I when I pull up on the mining site, the female staff can't even get out the vehicle. They're not even allowed, you know. And these are mining sites wow. that I actually own, and that's how the boys they I mean they really stick to their guns with when it comes to that that kind of belief. So and but you know that's a thousand different beliefs. So, and some of it too is, I'll be honest, some of it is bull crap. I mean, really, some of it really is bull crap. I, if I, I got some chiefs right now in some areas that I mind that anytime they want a new vehicle or they want more money or they want to travel somewhere, they will declare a, a certain day holy. You know, you can't mind on Wednesday. And when you can't mind on Wednesday, you know, they declare that day holy. And some, for some whatever immaculate reason or miracle, a good fifteen hundred dollars, or two thousand, or ten thousand dollars can make that day perfectly okay. Okay, oh, it's okay to do Wednesday now. You know, the chief has been settled. You know, so <laughs> right. Well, you so said a lot that of corruption. And they, yeah, corruption reigns. So it's like money talks. You know, so people they're like, oh yeah, a little bit of money will change their mind. You know. I think we skipped yeah. on one point. How how exactly? Did you did you get bestowed this power? Was it just because you got you got money? You sound like you got money. You talk like you got money. Was it <laughs> I mean, the money? You mine, I mean, you mine. So essentially, there's there's money no, to be made. Yeah, brother said he owns mines. I'm wondering, was it the money? Did he just have a lot of money? It was like, eh, what what'd you do? What did you do that was so special? I would, if it, I wish it was about the money, it would be easy. I wouldn't have to go and sit and reside with all this craziness that I that I believe sometimes. What what happened with me? Let me just be honest. Oh. And a lot of people don't know this. When I was bestowed, I I literally did not know I was going to my own bestowing ceremony. Because when I was asked to be bestowed ahead of time, like a few months ahead of time, 
I never responded. I was a little, I know what the chief's jobs are. I know what they're responsible for. I know I've delivered a baby in a wheelbarrow before. And I know because I know because they didn't have a hospital and, and they were the, the dad was pushing the wife in the yeah. wheelbarrow about 17 miles. And then we were going along, going on a scouting trip and we stopped and we saw them and I literally helped deliver the baby. And so, you know, I know what the chiefs, I know what that job entails and I know what's expected. So I kind of ran. I did my own thing where we would, you know, give money, help with medicine, build schools, help build, uh, you know, palava huts, which is like community centers. I would do all that kind of stuff, but I didn't want that responsibility. So okay. one day, uh, and, and my wife is actually from Liberia. I normally don't talk about my family. It's, it's a little dangerous part to it, but I normally don't. But she's also a politician there. Mm-hmm. She said, Raymond, um, I want you to, I want you to go to ceremony with me. And I said, Muna, I don't, I don't feel like it today. I said, cause in Africa on Saturday, Every every Saturday, you either go into a wedding or a funeral. I'm I'm not joking with that. I, sometimes I can attend four in a day. There are two funerals and two weddings in the same day. And with her being a politician, it's always some type of event we got to go to. So I said I don't feel like it. So I know something wasn't right when when she asked. I had what I had I, when I finally agreed to go after she harassed the heck out of me. When I finally agreed to go, then I, I had on you know some clothes and she said no, you can't wear that. I said, why not? You said it's not that big of a deal. I, can, I don't feel like changing. No, I want you to put on this shirt and this. And I said, whoa, 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 something, something ain't right. But anyway, I changed, and we ended up going to a ceremony. And when we were sitting in the second row, I remember sitting on the row. I remember seeing some some other dignitaries there. And I remember thinking to myself, I said, damn, this is kind of a, a, a small event. There's a lot of people here. So didn't think none of it. The queen came out. She greeted me. I know the queen very well. She came out, she greeted me and so on. And the the two people that were sitting next to me, I noticed that they got also bestowed. And these were guys, one of them were running for president of the country. He's running for president now. And another one was a very big, some kind of guy who owns some distillery in uh, Great Britain or somewhere, or in England somewhere. Mm. And uh, uh, he, he would, and both of those guys were from Liberia. And they went out and, you know, made real, made real big names for themselves. And then just recently, see, just to make a long story short, I had just did a lot of development in one of the buildings. I built a lot of houses. And not necessarily houses like what we do here. We normally use nature things. Like we use the mud, and then we plaster the wall of the mud with concrete. And so these houses, I mean, you'd be surprised what, what you can what you can do with it. And then I'm sitting there, and then I saw the two chiefs go up and crown the first guy. About 15 minutes later, the second guy gets crowned with two chiefs. And then I see seven chiefs standing up, and I the first thing hit my mind was, man, whoever the hell this is about to be, this is about to somebody about to really be crowned because it they normally don't use that many chiefs for this type of crown. They normally take one or two chiefs to crown you. When I saw the seven chief, and then I heard the name Jolly Long. When I heard the name Jolly Long, Jolly Long was a very powerful chief, even during the reigns of Charles Taylor. I don't know if y'all remember during the Liberian Civil War, Charles Taylor with the blood diamonds and the yeah, the big, I saw that movie. It, yeah, yeah, the the yeah, that all all this is uh, the 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 real movie that's based on that had a lot to do with Liberia was a movie with um Nicholas Cage, and he was a gun runner. I can't remember the name of the oh, movie. Lord of uh, Ghost Rider. Ghostwriter. Lord of War. Lord of War. Okay, yeah, was... with Nicholas Cage. That's a that that movie depicts Charles Taylor. Okay. And so uh so I'm sitting there and and all of a sudden I see every seat around me get empty. Man, my stomach started to turn. I, I knew I knew what was up when I saw that. And then when I saw the queen come out do her traditional dance and then I seen all the dancers come out, and I was like, oh, God, I, I, I've been bamboozled, hoodwinked. <laughs> why, why didn't you just coming. say no, man? Why didn't you just say, uh, look, I think when the people choose you, man, you can't say no, you know? And and, and that sounds uh, horrible, because when, uh, hey. when Trump did it right now, it doesn't sound good, but... <laughs> but um, they, they, finesse, they finesse you, man. You got finesse. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> honestly how I got how I got bestowed and I literally to be honest with you for about seven or eight months mm-hmm. I took it to be an honorary thing and I'll never forget one time I was somewhere 
And as a group of women, as I was walking through, they all started bowing down, getting on their knees. And when the chief hey. walks in, hey. yeah, when, and got to basically touch the back of their shoulder or their shoulder to, you know, to let everybody know it's okay to stand and rise before royalty or whatever. And I remember telling the lady, I said, oh, you don't got to do that. And the queen overheard me say that. And she grabbed me by my arm and she took me to the side. She said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I was just letting it. She said, hey, Raymond, let me tell you something. She said, I don't know. I've been watching you the last few months, and I've noticed that when, when we when we do events and you show up, you're not showing up in your traditional dress. You're not showing up uh, behaving like a chief. So on, and she gave me this whole thing. She said, let me tell you something. These people chose you to lead them out of poverty. They chose you to make their life better. She said, you may be looking at it like a headache, but they looking at you like God sent. And she said, this ain't no honorary title you have. That ceremony bestowed you as an authentic paramount chief over these people. So either you're going to, and she said, until the day you die, that's your responsibility. She said, you oh, didn't wow. choose it. It chose you. Oh, Man, wow. my, uh, every time I talk about that, and that, that's how it happened. And then I remember, and I remember going back through the whole thing in my head when she was talking about, well, this guy did this, and she was naming off, and it's only when she started really naming off all the things, I never thought people paid attention to some of that stuff that I was doing. You know, we, we build, okay, we go to a village, we're going to mine an area, we do some exploration, we do a little scouting, and okay, to build a mud house costs about $1,500, and you can build like a three-bedroom mud house, a really nice-sized mud house. What? Then you need to do to plaster it with concrete takes another fifteen hundred dollars. So about three to thirty five hundred dollars, you literally got a fifteen hundred square foot house with roof, everything. The okay. crazy part about it, I didn't really see that as nothing because we have been doing that so often over the last twenty years. It became kind of common thing to me. I will build myself a mud house because I know I'm gonna stay in that village. And you got electricity there. I mean, you don't think of it like nothing. I'm telling you, you walk in, you see 40 inch plasma TV, you see everything in a, in a common house. And you got modern furniture with a recliner, with, I got lazy boy, you got all of that stuff, you know, everything powered by generator. So you, you living good. Okay. And so it never don't, mean, but to them, it meant everything, you know, it meant everything. So from that point on, I, 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 I changed my mindset about it. And even now, even just last week, I went to a, uh, I'll tell you this real quick. I went to a uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting and I wore, <laughs> I wore the traditional gown. So here I'm is, I'm in, uh, in a little DeSoto Paris, Louisiana, you know, a, with all the dice Oh yeah, man. <laughs> we talked about, oh, everybody <laughs> swore to God I was Muslim and, uh, <laughs> It was crazy. I, this is, and then I showed up. This is the crazy part. One of my good friends, uh, a white lady, she, she came and picked me up and she said, Hey, I'm bringing another one of my friends that you already know. I said, Who is it? Oh, the investment lady. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here I show up with two blonde headed white women <laughs> wearing this, all this African gear. So every, you, you got to know we to talk of the, the whole chamber meeting. Everybody can't stop looking at us. And then, uh, <laughs> Three new stations was there. I mean, it was it was hilarious. Oh man, so, <laughs> that sounds like a, that sounds like a really interesting time. That's a, I mean, that's that's just a that's a great story. So let me go ahead real quick. We'll take a quick break and we'll come right back and finish uh, the interview up with uh, Dr. Youngblood here, and we'll be right back on the Crazy Town podcast. The Crazy Town Podcast. All right, and we are back on the Crazy Town Podcast here with uh, Dr. Raymond Youngblood. Uh, international gold miner, Paramount Chief. Um, in the first part of the interview, we talked about your, your chiefdom and things like that. I wanted to touch base. You said you grew up in Louisiana, down in the, you know, in the country. How, how did you go from growing up in Louisiana in the country to international gold miner? Like, what, is, what, what was the journey winning like? international gold miner. Right, award winning, award winning, and we'll touch about that as well. So let's get the story about how you got to this point of gold mining, and then we'll touch on that as well. Okay, let, I'll give the abridged version here. Um, basically, when I first started, I went to I went to college at a university called Park University in in Missouri. And one of the wonderful things about Park is that it was very diverse. 
as a matter of fact, I remember when I was there, I think we ranked third in the nation in diversity behind UCLA and Michigan State. So when you walk into our cafeteria, you can see the flags from countries all, all over the world. And I think one of the things that made it so unique was that Park is one of those only schools that, that is, uh, located on every U.S. Air Force base in the world. So, uh, and it was created by a gentleman by the name of Colonel Park, who was, who was an Air Force colonel. And I played basketball and a lot of the guys that played soccer or football, what well, we overseas, well, what they say football, uh, they were from all these different countries, Angola, Liberia, Sudan, Britain, uh, Brazil. I mean, they, these guys were from all over the world. And so me being country boy from Louisiana, I'm there playing basketball and basketball being a, you know, the most, pop, at that time was the most popular sport on campus. You just, everybody get to, everybody got to know you. But, you know, country boy, me, I figure it like this. I also, anybody I sit next to, if I'm within hand reach of you, I'm going to say hello. Whether you want me to or not, whether I'm on a New York subway, which I've almost gotten into a fight, fight yeah. over because I spoke to somebody. He's definitely or, from the South. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Friendly. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, and then everybody get to know you on campus. And then when, you know, you know, I could hoop a little bit. So that, that even made popularity more. More good for me. You and don't so, have a jumper. <laughs> I can tell by your picture, you don't have a jumper. <laughs> uh, okay, now, now, now see, now Jonas TNT is going to make me, and I got to I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get up. I got to address it, Jonas. Please allow me. Oh, absolutely. I think yeah, I, you tell him what's I up held, about basketball. I, I held three school records. I held three school records. I got two that's still standing right now. One. It's the percentage in three pointers. They, the newspaper, the Kansas City Star newspaper used to write about the three pointer extraordinaire. This is way back before internet, so I hope it's out there. Three pointer extraordinaire, and I got two slam dunk contests on my on my belt. Oh, TNT. And, uh, oh, I got both out. <laughs> oh yeah. And so, um, a friend of mine who who was actually from from West Africa, actually you know from Africa, uh, West Africa. Talked about, you know, doing some things in his village. And long story short, I ended up taking a trip over there. I actually went over there to broker timber. I didn't even go for mining in, in the first place. Went to broker timber and saw the mining activities. And that's where it struck me. And it's not that we're not new here in Louisiana to mining because not even 15 minutes from where I'm at is one of the largest coal mines in northwest Louisiana. Uh, drag line, you know, doing, uh, coal for power lines. And then, you know, we grew up cutting timber and all these kinds of things. And when I, I never forget what the first time I met the chief, his dad, who was a chief, I met his dad. His dad said, well, you know, Raymond, uh, you seem like a very energetic guy. You're a young guy. I don't know if you can really pull this off, but you know, we will stand behind you if you can, because we don't know how to cut trees you know, to that degree. And I told him, I said, Chief, I said, but one way to cut trees to make a timber company. Today we're going to cut a tree. Tomorrow we're going to cut a tree. We cut one tree at a time. So it starts with one tree at a time. Once we reach our order, then we know. But these trees were massive. But what really stuck with me was seeing the small-scale guys out there mining. And to see a guy without, at that time, all the thermal imagery, without all the high-tech equipment, without all the radiation and radar and sonars and helicopters, with all this stuff, these guys were finding gold, finding silver, finding diamonds, and they didn't have any of this stuff. And I said to myself, man, that, that, I don't know how or whatever they're doing it. And I just gravitated towards it. And when I even when I would come back to the States, I worked some little piece of crap job somewhere and I worked at a lot of different places and every dime I got, I was sending overseas trying to fund operations and then it just stuck with me. And from, from, from that little small, uh, village that was based out of, uh, Angola, I remember, I can never forget this. When I saw, I, I was on a mining site and I saw a whole bunch of pregnant women working. And I remember thinking how wrong that was for them to do that. And I remember I said to myself, I will never have this on any of my sides. I, this, 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 this can't happen. And I remember one of the chiefs telling me, saying, let me tell you something. Don't bring your American bull crap over here. Them <laughs> girls need to work. Everybody here is earning their way. 
they can work up until the point to where when it's almost time to live in it, he said, but let me tell you something. If you wanted to work here and you wanted to make it work here, leave America there and come here and do what we got to do. But since that time, I've kind of changed my mindset about the mining. And then I went into more of a modern style of mining where, you know, we use equipment and all this kind of stuff. And now, um, when it comes to the award part of it, I have a, a legislation here in my name in Louisiana called Resolution 87, House Resolution 87 was granted to me in 2016, uh, making me the only black American international gold miner on planet Earth. There is no other. There's a lot of black guys that's mining, but I'm the only American black guy that's actually doing extraction. Now, when you go and you talk with a lot of guys that are doing mining, you are, when you really dive into what they're doing, you basically find out they're probably brokering or they're probably just investing, but they're not actually doing the extraction. They don't own any of the equipment. They have never gone out to the site. They doesn't, they don't do this stuff hands on. I do 100% of all my exploration. I do 100% of all my extraction. We build about 70% of all of our equipment, whether it's jaw crusher, cone crusher, ball mills, trommels, wash plants, you know, um, processing plants, jigs, all these kinds of things we do 100%. And so, uh, and then in 2000, I think it was 2015, I wasn't, a, I was, I was a, a, a number knee, but I was never awarded uh, in the Mining Hall of Fame. There's a Mining Hall of Fame based in the U.S. I didn't even know there was a Mining Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't think but, uh, anybody did. Yeah, except for mine, yeah. Was probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably the guys yeah. who are in it. So, and, that, and most of the guys that are in that Hall of Fame are actually not even extractors. They are, they're actually like chemists who came up with this technique to, to separate, uh, mercury from, from zinc or they came up with some process to, you know, further turn aluminum into a stronger metal. You know, they they mainly did stuff like that. That's most of who's in that. And most, a lot of chemists and physicists in that Hall of Fame, not a lot of extractors. Okay. Now, you, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And then I received multiple awards overseas, multiple awards. I, I won't even get into the name and all those off. Okay. Now, you said when you went over there originally, it was for, it was for timber. Did you have a timber background before before you went to school, or did you grow up doing timber, or how, where does the timber come into it? The timber came into play. Um, I was my friend that played soccer. His name was John. I knew for <laughs> we was at a party one night, and as as most of the kids can do, everybody bring out their photo book. And uh, back then, you know, it was Polaroid and, and 35 millimeter process film. So everybody had these Polaroid books. And so John brought out his. And sure enough, he showed the pictures off. And everybody at the party starts laughing. Everybody's laughing because, I mean, look at all the chickens and cows because it's basically pictures of, you know, his family in the bush, you know, in this village. Well, out of everybody that's laughing, all the city people laughing, all the country people laughing. I wasn't laughing. The first thing I noticed was, I was thinking, man, these are some big trees, you know? And I said, uh, I asked him, I said, hey, man, uh, the next day after the party, I went back to him. I said, hey, man, I want to know about them trees. And he said, oh, man, all you want to do is laugh like everybody else. I just want to make fun of my village. I said, no, I'm, I'm being very sincere. I said, I grew up, my family hall did a lot of puckwood and railroad ties. My, my granddaddy owned a sawmill. I myself did a little puckwood. I said, my daddy did it. I said, no, man, I, I know about cutting trees. I know about lumberjacking. I really do. I said, but um, I said, I can't get over the size of the trees I saw in the background. And he said, no, you're just going to laugh at me. I said, no, I'm not going to laugh at you. Just let me see the pictures one more time. And from there, that's how I ended up going going overseas. But, yeah, my family do it. Even now, even now, I am um, uh, work with one of my cousins who, who does that for a living, haul timber. If you go to my site, um, Youngbloodindustries.com. You see, you see, there's MLJ Truck, and that's mainly what we do is cut and haul timber. Oh wow. Okay. So, so, so you you went over there because of the like your family ties to the timber industry. You saw the pictures, and then and then you ended up seeing these gold miners, and that's how kind of the ball got rolling, and that's how you got to where you were today, as far as mining and everything goes. As far as mining, but I, I don't want to make it sound like my family was timber gurus or no. We were just. <laughs> Right, right. We were just, we just, we just folks that, you know, making living paycheck to paycheck at that time. And 
you know, that's something that's something you, you buy old puck with you for five, ten thousand dollars. And, you know, now and this is all the way back when remember now they used to load the logs uh with a wrench. This is even before the the loaders and and the cranes and all these things. Back then the guys I remember when we used to put the logs on the truck, the truck had a winch on it. And then and when the winch didn't work, you have to tie a rope in a tree and then pull the logs up on the on the on it that way. And you can only get two loads a day because of all that. But yeah, that, that's that's how we got started. That's how I got started at least. Oh wow, that's 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 a crazy story. So now now when you do these extractions, yeah, I know you said now you use like high tech equipment and you know radars mm-hmm. and, and heat and all this stuff. Like does all like all the gold you find the min I mean the jewels the I mean what. Does that go to you? Does it go to the company? Is it, I mean, like, how does that, you know, how does that play out? Is it all for you or is it for for your mining company and you put that back into the business or like, or do you broker that out and someone sells it for you or? Okay. Basically what it is, is just think of, just think of all of gold. Let's use gold for an example. Let's use a hundred grams as as a, as a uh, even number here. You take a hundred grams of gold and out that hundred grams, 30 grams of it is going to go towards expenses on fuel and maintenance and, 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 uh, you know, that kind of thing. Then you take another 10 grams and that's going to go towards salaries and payroll, you know, and that kind of thing. So that leaves basically 60%. And then you can take another, say, 10% out of that and you can put it towards the future of the company, you know, buying new equipment, um, hiring new people, buying laptops and that kind of stuff to modernize a little bit. So that basically leave you at 50%. And then you're going to take, I'd say, another 8 to 10% that's going to go toss all of your consulting duties, uh, open quote, close quote, wink, wink, wink. Uh, in America, we would say <laughs> uh, bribe, okay? <laughs> oh, wait, wait, okay. Like, what, can you explain, like, what you're, what that's for? Are you like? Do you have to bribe the area right. to get to use their land, or what? Do you, where? What are the bribes for? No, that's a that's a whole nother process. The bribe is going to be that, uh, uh, huh. man. Let me just be straight with it. Okay, maybe you, maybe your guys is is uh being transported back and forth from the mining site, and there's police along the highway every day. That police is going to stop your vehicle. Sometimes too, maybe it's a low-level police officer, maybe it's a captain or somebody like that, and they want money every day for whatever reason. Then maybe there's a politician that you have to squeeze a little something to just to make sure that your documents that you file with the government office is pro- processed properly on time and, uh, wow. and not filled up somewhere. Then so, so the police and the politicians are basically shaking you down because they know you're making good money. They they do the same shit here in, in the states. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a little better. I, I'll give y'all if we have enough time. McGee, just remind me to give you my Wall Street story. Uh, I'll make it very quick about about the word corruption. But um, but yeah. So by the time it's all over, you left with you. If you are a very good extractor, you can end up with anywhere between forty to sixty percent. Of the out of that hundred grams, out of every hundred gram, you could be left with forty to sixty percent if you really know what you're doing. And then there, now there's some things that that's out of your control. Sometimes during rainy season, that's a lot of things that's out of your control. You know, guys, uh, for example, like myself, I mean, we've gotten to be so, high, I mean, knock on wood, so good at it that even during the worst of rainy season, we're still able to extract. Where a lot of companies have to shut down, literally. Big mining companies that receive billions of dollars in Wall Street investment, I'm passing them in the bush. They're leaving the bush because they can't work, and I'm going in the bush because that's what we do. The worst, the worst it is, the most harsh it is, you know, that's when people call us. Literally, if there's a war, like for what's going on in Sudan, nobody's going to call a general mining company, even some of your great names. They're not going to call them to go and mine. They're going to call Youngblood. Because there's rebels there or there's warlords there. And there's a good chance that I probably know them rebels and warlords. Probably have sat down, had dinner with them, uh, have given them iPads and, and Android uh, tablets and everything Get else. Get out of here. Yo. So I'm just being serious. So you're Yo, dealing with, like, through, like, these, like, you know, these, well, whether they're warlords, like, these high-ranking criminal entities 
that are like, uh, it, you know, so in between like the government shaking you down, then there's like these criminal type entities that are trying to shake you down or that you need to make sure that they're happy because, so I mean, why don't you, what's the best story you have about either like a, something, a, a, a politician, a cop, a warlord, someone that you've had to deal with that like you may have thought, oh God, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, you, you know, you ever been in danger? Has your life ever been threatened? Well, I know that they get they get down in Africa, man. That's why yeah, I'm, not man, going, uh, I'm not going to Africa. <laughs> I don't care what the bag looks like. <laughs> let me let me say this. Let me say this. Most people you would know him as a warlord, but that's what we call him. If you go in and talk with the people who they're fighting for, they actually call him. Uh, a savior, because if it wasn't for that person, with say for example, I tell people this all the time. Let's, Great Britain wants to break away the Brit whole thing with Great Britain breaking away from the U the UK. Everybody says this. Everybody got their reasons why. But when you go and you sit down with the places where Britain is actually uh, investing, you will come to find out that they're not breaking away from the UK because they want they want to break away. They want to break away because they're tired of sharing their African resources with all the other countries who are not vested in Africa and, and not taking the chances and develop that kind of thing. When it comes to some of the warlords I know, <clears throat> some of these guys, when you sit down and you listen to their story, you can't help but say, man, that is that is something to fight for. You know, what do you do if somebody has committed atrocities against you and there's nobody to stand up for you? And then, but I'm part of a government who's funding the people that's suppressing you. Well, of course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call everybody that's not on my team bad, whether it be warlord, rebel, whatever the case may be. But when you go and you sit down and you listen to them and you listen to their story, it all, I promise you, almost all the story starts with a whole group of people got killed for no reason. We sit in our village. We're minding our own business. We have diamonds on our land. A French mining company or whatever company it is, or Australian or American, whatever, want these diamonds, and they came and they told us to leave. And we said no. Then our government came and told us to leave. And we said we've been here since the days way before Christopher Columbus. Why should we leave? This is our land. Then they come and they try to force us out. Then when we get the best of them in the fighting, then all of a sudden we get labeled as war criminals and we get labeled as warlords and we get labeled as rebels because we're fighting the status quo. But what they're not telling you is, they're not telling you that the only reason they want us to leave this land or the reason they're killing us is because they want the diamonds that's in the ground. That's a lot of the stories. I'm not saying that there's not some story where there's just some bad guys out there that wants to do bad things. There is. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, when you sit down with them and you listen, because one of the things I tell my people all the time, one, we're not on no political team side. I'm not for a Democrat. I'm not for a Republican. I'm not for this. I'm not for that. The reason being is the jungle don't have enemies. Either you can or you can't. Either you can survive or you can't. So in the jungle, you better get to know the priests and the warlord. You better get to know the president of the country and the chief. If you don't know the people in between, you're not going to make it in the jungle long. Because once you leave outside of the city area or the urban areas or outside of uh, where the police officers have street lights, then you just left up to all your own devices as to how you're going to survive. And so if you go in, I know, I know some pastors and some apostles and some priests that literally sneak stuff to the rebels and the warlords to keep them going. And at the same time, they're praying over the head of the president who's also raising the war against these people. So you have all this stuff that's going on. And for me, when I first, when I first kind of caught on to what was going on, I was, I had this whole thing. I say, somebody would say to me, say, okay, here's a village that's a hundred miles. Here's a village that's a hundred miles through rebel territory. And the village is struck in with, uh, disease. And then I got medication that I'm going to drop off to the, uh, to the village. Then I've had some activists. They will call me and they say, oh, you're such a bad guy. I said, why you say that? Well, you gave some medication to the rebels. I said, yeah, I did give some medication to the rebels. That's how I was able to give the, the medication to the villagers. Otherwise, they were going to kill me and the villagers. So what do you want me to do? 
Oh, well, you shouldn't do that. So I should let the villagers die. Well, no. Oh, no, no, no. I would say, I, I'm, I, I'm out to pay a fine for it saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Y'all should bring y'all ass in here and then tell the rebels you ain't going to give them <laughs> get the medication. So, right? You, right. You know, so you have to literally pick your poison. And then, and the thing about it is, is, for example, I'll give you this, this real quick. I've, I've spoken with CIA. I've spoken with the U.S. State Department. I've spoken with the FBI. I've spoke, you name it, I've spoke with them. I know where there's terrorists. I know where they training because I'm in the jungle all the time. I can take you to where the Chinese is literally drilling oil way more than what Exxon Mobil and Chevron is doing in the middle of the bush. But this is not on record because of corruption and it's not on record because we're not paying attention to that. So when we go and we say Exxon is the world's largest oil company, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, not even close, not even close because the Chinese is in the jungles of Africa. The Russians are in the jungles of Africa. The Indians are in the jungles of Africa. America, we just stay in the little tourist area. We go over to this safari and we want to know. And so this is this is one of the biggest problems I think that's going on. But uh, when it comes to a story, I'll give you this quick story. I'm in the bush. I'm not going to name the country because I, I I try not to name the countries because I try not to give the bad. When you tell us the stories like I tell, it, it can scare the heck out of people because I, it, it, they're just bad things that have happened. On the other hand, there is absolutely no place that I've gone on this planet Earth, this is the God on the truth, that I have not had some level of fear from New Orleans to New York to Sudan uh to 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 Nigeria to Brazil I've I've had a little bit of fear I I the only time I was robbed where I thought I was going to die this is the truth I'm not joking with you was one time in New York and one time was in New Orleans of all the times I've been held at gunpoint all the times I've been held against my will which we would call kidnapping all this stuff even even when I was put down in the back of a truck and driven through the desert just to go to a camp with some guys, just to have a conversation, and I had to pretend like I knew Michael Jackson, and I had to pretend like I knew Michael Jordan, and I don't know none of these people. <laughs> but since I'm an American, oh, wow! Since I'm an American, we got to do this. When I was in Eastern China, or uh, some gangsters, and this is the first time I realized that Yao Ming was not as big as Shane Battier when he played for the Houston Rockets. I was sitting there thinking to myself. These, why are these guys so in love with Shane Battier? <laughs> Shane Battier is a role <laughs> for <laughs> oh, oh, what was the boy name, man? Oh, 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 um, main guy that played for the Houston Rockets. Um, I can see his name. Tracy, I can see Tracy his McGrady. Um, he, oh, Tracy McGrady. At that time, it was Tracy McGrady and, and Yao Mean and, and Sean Battier. Everybody was in love with Shane Battier. They were like, do you, do you know him? And I, I already learned this lesson years before. If I don't know him, I'm going to tell you I know him because they think all Americans know each other. I was like, yeah. Oh, wow. He's an awesome basketball player. He, this, he said. And I remember thinking that, uh, you know, but here it is. I'm in the middle of the bush, and I had about, it's about 27 of us. And so we're walking through, and this is back when I was, when we used to, before we were, became a little bit better than what we are now, we, back when we first got started. And then all of a sudden, all I heard was gunshot. I mean, just, no. just, just rabbit all over the place. Everybody running helter skelter. Then all of a sudden, I feel, uh, something hit my leg. And I, I actually thought, I actually thought something juked me like, like a, like a bamboo or something juked me. And when I hit the ground, I can remember feeling like my leg was on fire. I mean, I'm not talking about like a, like a pastor condemned to hell, hot fire. <laughs> and so I hit that ground and then before oh. I, had, I had, I felt like, ooh, I, I, I just remember blacking out, and when I came to, I remember I went to touch my face. This is what I can remember really well. I, remember, I went to touch my face, and I remember thinking, damn, my head is big. Because when I went to touch my face, about four or five inches out, my eye had swollen out that big. And I thought to myself, my hand is a little bit too far away out to, for my head to be this big. And it was probably like a Wednesday. By the time I realize where I was, I had been knocked out that long. It was a Saturday. And I had been laying there. Lucky for me, no animal came along. 
and did something to me or they didn't do anything to me. And still today, I can't tell you where half my people at. Still today. So, you know, that's just, and whether, whether somebody in my own group side us up, whether we just got ambushed, but one of the things that taught me is, I may be the king in this area, but somebody else is the king in that area. And when you tr- cross over lines and you're going through somebody else's territory, yeah. what do you want to respect? You better get somebody's approval that you can walk through there. Because apparently, what, what I come to realize is, I didn't know that rebel, and I had this whole American mindset that, oh, I got the central government's permission. So since the central government has given me permission, I can go here. Well, apparently another group felt like, no, they didn't give a hoot about what the central government had to think about that. And I didn't get their permission. So, wow. you know, I got my butt whooped and looked at life. But some of my people lost lost their life. And if, if we talk about some of the worst stories I got, it, it will be, it will, it will all be around the mining and uh, some of the bad decisions that I've made as a leader, some of the bad decisions that we've made as a team, as a company, you know, and has gotten people killed. And I myself, man. Um, wow. So that story you this- just told us, like where where you know you blacked out, woke up, everything like that. So that was like a rebel group that ambushed you as you were traveling, is what you assume happened then. Or yeah, that's a that's what I'm thinking that happened. It was a, it was some 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 renegade. Maybe maybe it was a part of a big team. Maybe it was a scouting group. Maybe it was just a, a little breakaway. But you know they were sophisticated enough to have machine guns. So that tell you that they was a test somewhere somehow to be able to have those uh you know those uh machine guns. Right. So you had the permission so, from that government, but these people were rogue, renegade, whatever you want to call them, and felt when they saw you, you didn't ha- get their permission from their leader, warlord, whoever it was, and that's why they took you as you know t- went, were hostile against you essentially. That that's why I'm thinking it happened. I got my butt whooped, got shot, and was. Knocked out, so I can't really tell you. <laughs> right, but right. that's what I'm assuming. That's what we, that's what we pieced together after everything was over. Yo, yo, so, Jonas, Jonas. Yes. Um, I think this guy's legit, man. <laughs> I, yeah, See, I no, mean, no, no, Jonas didn't believe. Didn't oh, believe. Oh, whatever, you. dude. Don't even. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I, I thought, you know, especially the way you were presented to me, I, I thought that you you might have been bullshit. But I've been low key. Googling you a little bit here, and you looking pretty. You looking pretty, uh, pretty legit. I can't find anything oh, about your slam dunk business. <laughs> so that's still that's still up in the air. But. Okay, I, I want Jonas. Jonas, yes, Jonas. Allow allow me allow me to tell TNT this quick, quick, quick. So I promise you, I, I wrap it up in thirty seconds. Oh this no, that's story. fine. Yeah, take your time, man. We, okay, we, we're not in any hurry. Okay, T, I'm, I'm in this slam dunk contest, right? I'm going to give you the dunk ID. <laughs> and I bet this with my staff. Yeah. I bet this with my staff that they had a hard time. It, it only took uh, – they po- they posted it on the Facebook page, I think. Uh-huh. They wanted – when I saw it, I got I got angry at first because I was like, why are they putting this out there? This is an incomplete thing. This is stuff that we talk about amongst each other. But apparently with the staff, it's a big thing because they just have a hard time believing I had some ups. So I said – uh. They, they, I saw the thing on Facebook where, where it said something like, um, it said something like, can somebody verify if Dr. Youngblood ever did this dunk in college? Let me tell you what the dunk is. Let me tell you what I did. What I did was, the first dunk that I did, um, uh, was, uh, I was the shortest guy in the dunk contest at six foot one. Yeah. The first dunk I did was, I threw the, I bounced the ball off the floor, hit the backboard. This is really simple. And I went up, I caught it. Now, what people used to like about me was all the little, little fizzazzy stuff I can do when I was in the air. Twist my body a little bit, turn, twerk a little bit. And then when I was slammed, I only weighed at that time like 185 pounds, 190 pounds. And it sounded like the rim, sounded like I was 300 pounds when I was slammed because I knew how to snap the rim to where it would make this like thunder sound. And how I learned how to do that was when we first started learning how to dunk, we didn't have breakaway rims, you know. Uh-huh. So you had that these red breaks that we, yeah. So yeah, you crack your finger open if you ain't know how to do it. So when I first learned how to dunk on a breakaway rim, I can make the rim snap away with that like pow, like it would make this big thunder sound sound like I slammed the ball so hard. Well, the second dunk I did was I did that same dunk except this time 
I turned backwards in the air and I did almost like a, not like a 360, like a 290 or something. And everybody went crazy. So <laughs> uh, a partner of mine, one of my teammates, he said, man, he said, everybody like it when you turn, man. I said, uh, I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I said, I got, remember that dunk I tried to do? I missed it. He said, oh, he, he said, you ain't, you don't try that, man. Do this. I said, no, I'm gonna do this. I went up. This is the dunk I did. You haven't seen this dunk done by nobody. I tapped it off the backboard, turned completely in the air, threw it down uh, uh, backwards. Mm -hmm. When I tell you that everybody erupted, the whole place erupted. Everybody was like, what the hell did I just see? Yo, I'm I'm, I'm going to need to see this dunk. Post it to your Twitter, man. I guarantee you. (laughs) I will like and retweet this dunk. I want to see it for myself. (laughs) Me too, me too. So So I I got Go to my Facebook page, you'll see I got some teammates who, 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 can, who, 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 who's been verifying it. They're like, yeah, he really did that. I, I got one who told me, he said, man, I hate to, I hate to tell people you had more ups than me, but I got to tell the people, you, yeah, you did that dunk. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Dr. Young, I'm going to take another break. You going to come back for one more segment with us? I think we got some more to talk about. If sure, you're down. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Well, we'll be right back on the Crazy Town podcast, and we'll come back for our third part of this interview with Dr. Raymond Youngblood. We'll be right back. The Crazy Town podcast. And welcome back to the Crazy Town podcast, part three of the interview with Dr. Raymond Youngblood. Um, I want to just get right into something kind of a little more light. We've been talking about warlords and stories and everything. We have something we ask everybody that comes on the show. If you could, do you do you like pizza? I mean, that's not the question. Oh, yeah. But but do but do you like pizza? I like pizza. Okay. Who doesn't? Dude, some people I'm sure don't like pizza. If you could only have the same two topping pizza every time you order pizza from now until the day you die, what two toppings are on that mm. pizza? Wow. Uh, does cheese get to be a topping? Yeah, cheese, cheese, cheese will automatically be on there, yeah. Cheese yeah. is inherent. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna choose, uh, Canadian bacon and sausage. This guy's off the show. All right, that's the end of the interview. <laughs> oh, whatever. End of the interview. <laughs> so, so what's really funny about this is, I'll tell you our, t- our two, we, we actually pick, I picked double bacon and he picked double mushrooms. So, so, what? so that's what. what? what? Did he pick yes, I picked double mushrooms. They're delicious. Yeah. Oh, goodness. What piece of man are you? <laughs> <laughs> Questioning your manhood about double mushrooms. See. Oh, he did. He did say he was from Ohio. He did say he was from Ohio. Wow. Oh, oh man. He was from Ohio too. Though. I am also from Ohio. <laughs> That's all right. It's all right. It's all right. But so that's you know that's one of the questions we got. TNT, you want to you want to ask him any questions? Yeah. Woo. <laughs> hey, uh, so how how do you feel about uh how do you feel about ghosts? Have you ever had any supernatural experiences? I know in Africa there's a there's a lot of uh superstition, and I've heard some stories. Mm-hmm. I've worked with some some Africans, some people from Nigeria and stuff, and they they that's a big part of their culture. But have you personally? ever had any experiences, a haunted house you lived in or anything that's happened to you while you were across seas. Or even ask why you're in the jungle. Anything but yeah, anything along those lines. To not believe in ghosts uh would not be doing a service. Yes. I believe in it and I've seen some things that, that can never probably be fully explained. Give me For a sure. story. We want to hear your your best you one. You got a good Give one you your, can tell us? Best I got, I got, I got one I can tell you. Okay, let me, let me, ooh, all right. All right. That, that, let me start with a little premise here. Half of my, half of my minors, if we don't do certain type of sacrifices, that I cannot get the guys to work on the mining site. Really? The well, guys like, like sacrifice that. like animals, yeah. like chickens or goats or things like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Chicken, oh, no, not, yeah, uh, it's not like my brother when he said chicken because he he don't like us bearing the expenses of the sheep and the goats, so he always try to trade off with chickens and frogs and stuff. <laughs> but but uh, but uh, yes, the guys sheep sheep cow and goats are the are the main sources of sacrifice. And, and one of the things that the guys a lot of the guys believe, even the guys that are Christians, even the guys who believe Jesus Christ is their Lord and mm-hmm. Savior, even the guys mm-hmm. who believe 
that uh, our law is their Lord and Savior and so on and so on. They will not work on some of the site. They will not. I don't care what I say. I don't care how much money I offer without a sacrifice to the land. Because once you take gold out the ground, they believe that the, the gods have to have something back because of the, because they believe that gold is 100% attached to God. 100%. Even when you take the L out uh, of, of, of gold, you got God. They believe it to tooth and nail. You can't make them believe nothing else. So unless we offer a sacrifice to the land, you can't get them to work. And I, I remember one particular case where uh, um, I gave you a couple little quick things here. One was I went to visit a, a chief friend of mine by the name of Chief Nana. We, and the chiefs can also be in Ghana, can be referred to as Nana, N-A-N-A. Mm -hmm. So we went to visit Chief Nana, but Nana Badiako. And Nana Badiako is, uh, he, he's actually not a paramount chief, he's a sub-chief, so he's kind of in the mid-ranking chiefs. And he, he has a pretty rich land. His land, on his, on Nana's land, the gold can literally grow on trees. But uh -huh. let me give you the scientific, me being, me being scientist, let me give you the scientific reason. The gold in the ground, gold normally comes in two forms. Alluvial, which is, which is, uh, basically a gold that's in, clay and sand and dirt and rocks, mm -hmm. and then hard rock, which is gold that's infused inside the rock and the stone. So the alluvial gold can normally be in the form which is called nuggets and dust. Dust can be as fine as baby powder and as, you know, as chunky as peanut, peanut brittle, okay? Okay. Well, this dust that's fine like baby powder saturates the land where Nana Badilkos live. And when these trees grow up, of course, that gold is being entrapped into the the bark of the trees as it as it goes up, wow. and that bark then extends out into the sea. And so, literally, gold grows on trees. That's so when cool. Nana takes me, this, yeah, so you can you can literally walk through these bush, walk through this bush, and when you come out on the other side, you'd be glistening like you got glitter all over you from the leaves. Okay? Oh wow, how cool is so, that? So Nana, yeah, Nana tells me he says, uh. He says, uh, Mr. Raymond, I, we want to give you a blessing and so on and so on. So I, you know, I go and they show me the area and, and this area is, is, uh, 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 what is called a taboo, meaning that, you know, you can't mine here, but we can mine the area around it. And, uh, we, anyway, long story short, we go and as we're leaving, there's a ceremony taking place where the, there's a group of women warding off the devil. And the devil basically is something that will keep me from, from coming back to be able to mine the land. We're coming through. My convoy is coming through. I'm in the first truck. Uh -huh. And and I'll never forget the vehicle stalling. The women all dressed in red. They got, I don't know if it was blood. I think I want to say it was sheep's blood or chick. I don't know what the blood was, but they were wiping the vehicle with the blood. The vehicle stalled. The ladies were all dancing around it. The guy at the time was driving it. I kept telling him to start the vehicle. He said, Doc, the vehicle won't start. It, it won't even, the battery or nothing. I said, what are you talking about? We keep trying. This is the thing that got me. i never forget looking out the window right next to me. When I turned my head to look out the window, it was about five, four, six, seven women standing there. When I tell you the eyes was red like fire, I'm talking red. I'm talking about what? demonically red. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the first thought that went through my mind, okay? Where the heck they get these costumes from? But I knew better than that. I knew where I was. I'm in the middle of the jungle. I'm yeah. just trying to make sense of it. And then I remember them breathing on the glass and fogging it. And then all of a sudden, as they went from my vehicle to the next vehicle, the vehicle fired right up. Shut up. Fired right up. up. Wow. Yeah, that's, what? Then I got, I got another story that's, that's, that's not my story, but... It's one of my college, you know, I, I, I played at a couple of universities. One of my university coaches story. He, he took a basketball team, a girls basketball team to Africa. And <clears throat> I was one of the only teammates who believed this story. And the only reason I'm telling his story is it's his story. It's not mine. So sometimes people say, Oh, doc may be making this up. Coach told us that one of the, girl his best player broke her leg 
Mm -hmm. The Africans took that girl. They were playing on outside on dirt courts. Okay, he took a I think it was an AAU team. They took that girl. The visitors took that girl overnight. The bone was literally sticking out the girl's shin. The shin bone was sticking. Well, you can see it broken. You can see it sticking out of her skin. Compound fracture. The Africans. Yeah, took that yeah, compound. Took that girl, and the next day that girl played with a small limp. Wow. I'm the only. Now this is way before I went to Africa. <clears throat> I'm the only player sitting there, and believe it, because there are some things that happen here in Louisiana too that will make a person believe in ghosts. A lot of people won't tell you that because they think it, it, it takes away from their professional credibility. But anybody who believes in the afterlife have to believe in some form of it. So I, I, I do believe in ghosts and I, and I have a lot more story, but those to me are the most yeah. interesting to me. Well, I know, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana, like, don't they have a lot of people who practice like, um, uh, say a lot. Yeah, they have well, a history. A they have a history in, in some, in it, some yeah, voodoo. And some like yeah, and like voodoo and things like that. You know, um, it's synonymous with it at least. Well, right. You know, and you see like yeah, you know, hear yeah. stories and see movies and all that sort of stuff. Had you ever had you ever interacted with any of that or been around any of that when you were in Louisiana growing up or knew anyone or you know anything like that? Uh, oh, all day. Even right now, they tell you like a guy like myself. They would tell me if I went to somebody's house, I shouldn't eat any food or eat any unless I know the people well. Especially if you, especially if I, if I can get a little bit grotesque here, especially if you're dating a woman, you shouldn't eat any food, any red sauce, spaghetti, or anything like that. They they believe it's strong. Why? I mean, it's, it's Why shouldn't you eat anything with red in it from a woman you're dating? <laughs> what What's the premise? The, the premise is that she will put blood in it. Oh wow! From from, from her body. Oh wow! And what does that do? Yeah, what, what, yeah and what, what does that do? She wants to get. It's supposed to be some it's... type. Of love, it's supposed to be some type of love potion. Get the hell out of you here! You wondering why? Wondering why you can't break up with her? You wondering why if you try to go cheat on with 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 another woman, you can't do it? You know you have a hard time uh, uh, becoming excited. Uh, yeah, that's, having, that's what uh, they believe. Wow, that's crazy. So any, like, anybody who give you. Anybody who hit his interview from New York or California is going to say, this, this guy's out of his mind. Anybody <laughs> from Tennessee down is going to say, yep, yep, that's the Louisiana boy. He really know what he's talking about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I never let my girl cook me spaghetti or anything. Screw that. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have that stand. Or even a bloody, even a bloody rap state. You can't get a lot of Louisiana guys. They first start dating a girl, guys from Louisiana. And uh, Mississippi, you know, it's gonna be hard to get that guy to eat anything with with red in it from from a woman. Wow. They may not tell you that, but they'll find some excuse why they can't eat it. Right, right. Wow, right. I never even would have thought of that <laughs> in a million years. Ever again? Ever again? Not even at like a restaurant. He's no, the yeah, done. You never know. And to fall in love with the cook in the back. Right, I'm, right. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's. I have another another thing that we ask people on the show. If you mm -hmm. can take. If you could take two animals and ha and have them create like a combo animal with like you know logistics not being like you know obviously animals can't cross species or anything but if you could take two animals and mix them together and make your own animal for whatever purpose what would you pick and I'll give you our examples real quick so that way you have time to think and kind of see what we're talking about my first example okay. I did was I I would say I would want to mix a cheetah and a horse you call it a chores, and it would be it would be like or a heater or a hita, and it would be strong and fast, and you could ride it. You know what I mean? So it would be like a like a more powerful okay. horse almost. And then, That's pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, what uh what do you you have one that comes to mind? Even if it would help you with mining or whatever, anything you got? Oh man, I would probably I would probably love to see something like a elephant and a water buffalo. <laughs> a hairy elephant or a water yeah. buffalo with a long trunk? No, water bu the water buffalo that looks like a bull or, uh -huh. and, and, and the elephant. I would love to see something like that. That would be cool out there. This yeah, I had one ready, man. He's quicker than I was. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> All right, well, TNT, you want to tell him yours? Like your original? 
I oh my my good one or the one that you made fun of? <laughs> Let's do the one you made. I made fun of first. <laughs> I I just wanted to have like the dragon from a never ending story and like uh, a lizard so I could have a dragon that <laughs> I got that had lizard skin. Yeah. He is definitely from Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so many jokes. I love it. <laughs> and then uh, or I said. A gorilla with, with butterfly wings. Like, yeah, like a, that, a gorilla with monarch butterfly wings. <laughs> like they have like an army of those. Uh, I feel like I could take over the world. <laughs> oh, you know what? It'd be definitely be strong. Uh, I, I hate to run up on in the bush, in the bush they fly up on you because I've, I've had to run from those before. Oh, yeah, like from, oh, from gorillas. That's scary. That's scary. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Why don't yeah, you yeah, I've, I've why, had... yeah? Why don't you tell us a good story about some sort of like animal, like a gorilla story, or did you ever run into like you know other you know nasty animals that like you guys have literally had to either shoot down or run from or drive away from or whatever? Yeah. Okay, I, I got. Oh man, I got a lot of stories with the animals. I got one in particular. <clears throat> normally, when we when we first go into the bush, we are on a process called scouting. That's normally where there's no road. It's just just woods and you and however you get there. So we go and we hire these bike riders, these professional uh, bike guys with motorcycles, and we carry these 60-pound packs. And since most of our guys, you know, don't know how to ride motorcycles, or, so you, you hire professional riders to carry you, your body weight, like me at 200 pounds, plus a 60-pound pack, plus the bike, plus himself, and we going into the bush. And then a lot of time when you're crossing uh, little streams and, and rivers and stuff, it's normally just plank. Like sometimes it's like four or five boards nailed together, and you can walk across it. It's going to be wobbly and jiggling and shaking. And the longer the stream is, the worse it is. And sometimes they just cut down trees and lay the trees across, and you just got to cross it like that. So we're, we're going – and I'll never forget, we're probably going through the bush. It's kind of fast at about 35, 40 miles an hour on a foot trail. And so we're weaving, weaving, weaving. And then I got to pee. So I, I tap the bike rider. I, I got, I step, you know, we stop. And since I'm the chief, I got the best rider. So nothing should happen to the chief now. So here my guy, first thing he tell me, he says, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta hold on tight. So he want me to basically crouch behind him a lot tighter. Put my junk up against his butt tighter. Put my chest <laughs> against his back tighter. No, and because he's telling me I'm too far back and it's causing the bike to do all this shaking. So while we standing there, you know, I said, hey, man, uh, you know, deal with it. You know, uh, uh, I don't want my junk all up on your stuff, all up on right. your butt. And right. we going to a little bit. And when I turn around, I'm looking directly in my face, a cobra. What? Right in my face. Yes, I stand six feet one. I'm telling you that Cobra was looking at me right in my face. The only thing that blessed me that day was that Cobra was more afraid of me than I was of it. My pack, my nine millimeter, uh, the bike rock, both of us, everybody scattered. We scattered, the Cobra scattered. And I can remember seeing that snake back up. When I say back up, I mean it was, it was still standing about six feet tall. It wiggled backwards, turned, and then went through the bush. Okay, wow. now this is all the same story. So when we finally come back to where the bike is, pick it up and everything, and we collect ourselves, we get back on the bike, and then other, by this time, the other riders that are coming behind us are way back behind us because I also not only got the best rider, but I got the craziest guy on the planet. He We rolling through the bush at 35, 40, 30 miles an hour, and everybody else is behind us like at 20, 25, taking their time. We get back on the bike, and when we get ready to cross a bridge, the bridge is, as a matter of fact, I have this bridge. I have this on film. I, I will find it, and I will try to find it. Send it to you guys. The bridge is just wood. This, this trees laid across the river. And, of course, trees get smaller as they go, you know, as you go to the top, the trees get smaller. And as we're going across, I can see the, I can see the tire on the, uh, on the bike. And I can see him a couple times, he missed it. And we get down between the crack of two trees. And he come up out of that, and we still going. And then finally, he missed he missed the limb. I mean, missed the tree. Went down. Me, him, the pack, the bike, everything. Boom! Right into the water. Damn. This is probably one of the scariest time I ever had in my life. All of a sudden, you can hear the boom, 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 boom sound, the snorting in the water. That's the hippos. 
Oh, and those are the so, worst. Yeah, man. Those are the worst. The, the only thing that happened to me, I can, I never forget this. I'm standing there, and then the water, the water is up to like a little bit higher than my chest. The river was down, so that was a blessing. The other good thing about the hippos being around was there's no crocs. And I never forget a baby hippo. I can never forget the, 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 what is it called? The little, um, um, what's the whiskers on it? I can never forget how hard they were when they, when he bumped up against me. He kind of walked, came over, swam. I can see all the other hippos looking. None of them did anything. They just bumped. By this time, the rider, we, we trying to get the bike out the water. The baby hippo just kind of bumped me and went on by his way. And the, the hippos were all along the side. We pushed the bike on out. Uh, we had to take the, uh, some of the stuff off. We had to drain it out, all that kind of stuff. By that time, all the other bike was there and, you know, we went on our way. Oh, Another man. little quick story. I've been bit by a rhinoceros viper. I got that, I got that, uh, on picture. It caught me on my thumb. Rhinoceros. <laughs> no, no, no. I haven't had any wild encounters with that. But a rhinoceros viper, and this is, this is, I never knew this before, but just, just, this is inform- useless information, I guess, until you're in the woods or the jungle or whatever, but some snakes are poisonous and some snakes are venomous. And the wonderful thing about a venomous snake is that snake has the ability to release the venom or not release the venom. I never knew that. As, as much time as I spent in the bush, I ain't never, I ain't never known that. That is a true statement though. Oh, let me see. Uh, the one that I know, I, uh, I tell you, it's a long story, but I'm gonna make it short. Is uh, I when I, <clears throat> one of my first trips in the bush, I didn't know that um, constrictors like anacondas and pythons and all them could make noises. I never knew that, and it makes like a ook ook sound, you know. And you would think it's some kind of monkey or something, but I never knew that was a <clears throat> constrictor, and so. I never forget one night we have these little hoods, these little tents. We all sleeping outside. We have these little these little tents. And the first thing I when I woke up, I thought to myself, I said, I know, I know, one of these dudes ain't trying to crawl in this tent uh, on me. The first thing that hit my mind was somebody about to get beat down. <laughs> and I, I, could feel it, I could feel it on my shoe, so I'm I'm. I, I normally sleep with the um, with the uh, nine millimeter under my under my under my pillow or under the blanket whatever I use as a pillow. That's, that's and I'm gangster. trying to find it. Yeah, and I'm trying to find it. Just so anybody know, I normally carry two nines and a twelve. So oh my uh, God. <laughs> always uh, trapped, man. Chamber. He is a rapper. <laughs> Seventeen in the clip and one in the chamber. <laughs> and uh, so I'm feeling. I'm feeling for it, and I'm saying to myself, I can't find it. I don't know where it, so the gun has moved over. And then when I looked out, I can hear everybody outside. I hear all this commotion. Beat it, beat it, beat it. Get it, do it. And I can feel it. And all of a sudden, I can feel something tucking in my feet. Man, when I raise up and look, that was a constrict. The snake was trying to construct. It had swallowed, like, the top part of my boot. My feet, I still had my boots on. It had swallowed, like, the top part of my boot. It was trying to swallow. It was trying to swallow me, and they were outside beating the crap out of it. Trying to get it out the out the tent. Oh, like it was trying to uh, work you, like it was like you were like just like it's food, like uh, it just like he had got like part of your boot hit into his mouth. Yeah, was... <sighs> yeah, yes. The toe, the toe part was all way, all the way gone in, and I guess how because I didn't wear size twelve, so that that made it very difficult, and he couldn't get his mouth around. And the snake was for a constrictor, it was small, but it was probably maybe maybe a good. 11 to 12 feet. It was, it was about as big around as a man's arm. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm oh. so good on Africa, man. I'm so good. <laughs> All right. I want to touch on two things real quick before we wrap everything up. The first thing I want to I ask got, you I about. I got one. Okay. Well, I'll, I want to ask you, when I, I had mentioned to you that TNT was displaced, um, you had told me, or someone um, with your group had told me, that you guys have like a 10,000 African prayer team and people pray for everyone. Like, how did this come about? That's a lot of people to like pray for people and things. Like, is that something through your village or like something? Like, how does, like, how does that happen? How does that work? Oh, wow. Uh, the 10,000, no, that's not even, that number's not even close. It'll be probably quadruple that number. Oh, wow. Uh, so not only 10K, yeah. it's like 40K. <laughs> yeah, what it is, is 
a lot of the churches, you know, a lot of a lot of misconception about Africa is that everybody does juju, but uh, juju is actually a small part of Africa. Yeah. Christianity, Christianity, yeah, real big. And, and it's, yes, it's very big, and you have everything there from the Catholics to the Methodists, and so Pente- Pentecostals, you know, so on. But uh, normally, people like myself or in my statue, we normally have prayer groups. You know, the churches and, and uh, the different apostles and pastors and priests, they pull together people that go into the mountains or they go to some praise area and they pray for you. They pray for your your success. They pray for you to be able to help them. They pray for you, your health. And then what I'm supposed to do is I take people, like when I found out that TNT could possibly be displaced or was, you know, from my conversation with you was, uh, the team came back and said, hey, man, one of these guys on the podcast, you know, uh, think, think he's in the middle of the hurricane. I said, okay, well, add him to the prayer list. And so you, he would literally have maybe anywhere between 60 to 500 men of, men of God, whether it be somebody, an imam from a Muslim mosque or whatever, praying for him. Because all these different prayer groups, we send them an email or, or, or normally I hate to advertise people, but WhatsApp, we send it out to WhatsApp and it all go to them and the list go and then that person's on the prayer for that week or that month. You know, I just had a lady whose baby was sick. Um, a member of my royal family passed away. Her name was Jane Jeffrey Thomas. And she was the editor who edited a lot of my work, my books and stuff. And she was actually the first person that was in my family, in my royal family, in my chieftain. She passed away and she had a, a, a grandbaby who was sick. And I just spoke with the mother at, at her uh, funeral this, this past weekend. The mother was telling me, she said, I don't know what your prayer group did, but not only is that baby healed, but I want the prayer group to make him pipe down a little bit because that boy is all over the place. Oh, you know, wow. so, you know, it, yeah, just the, that, it, it's hard, it's hard to do the kind of work I do and be, and, and not have some level of faith, you know, so, yeah, so that, that's basically what the prayer group is, the prayer team. There's some guys that are bigger than me. They have, you know, millions of people that pray for them on a daily basis. I'm not joking. Wow. I'm telling you, a million gather and pray for the success of that human being. You know, oh. so yeah, it's crazy. So oh, yeah, man. he had that's impressive. Absolutely, thousand people. So, and then uh, uh, TNT's. 40, you said you had something for him too. I do. All right. Let's uh, look. Look, it's just me and you, Doc. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not. I, I don't call myself a, a pocket watcher, but what what's, what's your account sitting at, man? Are you at like a Mark Zuckerberg? Are you at a Jay Z? Are you at like a Drake? Or would you consider yourself at like a Ryan Seacrest? <laughs> <laughs> where where, where uh, do you think you're sitting right now? Because I'm thinking that you probably in like. Like about like halfway to Drake, maybe Ryan, a little bit above Ryan Seacrest, but I don't know. I'm hoping that you're doing lovely in life, but where where do you think you're sitting on that scale? I'm I'm the world's greatest jungle gold miner. So you sitting at Donald <laughs> Trump? <laughs> Donald Trump of all people to compare. <laughs> I pick Zuckerberg, but I I don't know, man. Zuckerberg money is like. You, you you the wrong color for Zuckerberg money. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but for real, so you doing you doing all right, bro? Huh? You doing I, all I, right? I, I tell you what. I tell you what, T. I tell you what. Um, if we if we count if we count it in gold, as most gold miners will tell you most gold miners got stashes everywhere. When I tell you everywhere, they got stashes at their house. They got stashes in the bush. They got stashes in different countries. At this girlfriend house, that girlfriend house, goal wise, I would tell you that it's, if you, if you just take my ability by itself for over 20 years, there shouldn't be any need for anybody suffering. Let me just say it like that. <laughs> Put it in the, in the, in the terms of yes. No one will be, no one will be hurt for, for anything. So, but yeah, but a, so, so a lot of so a lot of the the wealth uh, or riches is like it's still it it hasn't it isn't in liquid form it's like in gold form, like so you could if you need to you could liquidate uh, some gold and whatever but you couldn't just essentially go, tomorrow go pull a lot of your 
you know. This bank account is okay, Jonas. We're talking to a millionaire. I don't care what you say. He ain't got to say it himself. I know he ain't got to say it himself, but I know we're talking the, to a millionaire. The thing, about, see, the thing about gold, Jonas, is that we believe that it is the liquid. See, most gold miners believe that it is that is the currency. Well, that's true because, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the I'm ultimate about. currency because even if every government in the world falters, gold still holds its value across every country. Exactly. Exactly, yes. Exactly. That so, makes sense. You know, that's just, that, that's just how our mind works. Um, right now, the, like, I, the, if I, if I had the biggest thing that, <clears throat> the biggest thing that bothers me about all the gold that, that we mine or have, have is, uh, is, uh, is that you have a lot of miners who walk on gold, sleep on gold, pee on gold, the village, the dope. The village is built on gold, and yet they live in adjunct poverty, and that's something that's just bothering me to the to the heel. Well, right, that makes sense. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And one uh, last thing I want to touch on: you told me to remind you about your Wall Street story. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, we were talking about corruption, and we were talking about corruption, and the thing about it is, is, is this. When I, when I had a group from, uh, that wanted me to take my company public on three different occasions. And the, I think this was the second group. And then, so they sent this, uh, very high profile lawyer who had been, who had done all this work with all these big mining companies like Ken Ross, Red Bag, Newmont, you know, uh, man, she was well put together as far as that was concerned. So we went into, I went into New York. I went, uh, let me not say the place. I, I was in Manhattan on multiple occasions. First time I went, I went for a 45 minute meeting that ended up being about three days. Oh, God. So when I get to the meeting, yeah, I went to the meeting just to sign some documents and they were gonna, they brought, they had brought in all these experts that were supposed to authenticate me to make sure that I wasn't full of crap because they, there's no way somebody like this uh, uh, hint, hint. There's no way a black guy from Louisiana has all this stuff going on. <laughs> so uh, I'm sitting there and just imagine this huge. When I tell you this huge table, I'm, uh, I can I can never forget out that that mahogany redness to it. Beautiful room. And then when they brought me into the building, I remember going up. They say, "Well, this floor is for you." I said, "Okay." Uh, but, uh, so these people here that's working here, they'd be, I can, you know, have one or two staff. They say, no, all these people you see here, these people are for you. I said, what do you mean for me? Well, we hired all these people here that's going to be basically putting your stuff together. It was like 30 or 40 people, all these MBAs with MBA and economics and finance and all this kind of stuff. And I remember being like, wow, because now I'm, you know, the Bush guy, Bush miner like myself, I got, a whole bunch of miners, but I ain't got all this stuff going on. So right, right. we end up, we, the weasel, we, we walk through and they bring over some, you know, some little sexy, uh, uh, MBA who was supposed to shadow me and do anything I want, whether, you know, go for this and go for that. And I remember thinking to myself, in Africa, we have these kind of women, but they ain't there to be doing my finances. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Right, right. Right. So, I, I get there, and then in walks an army of accountants and CPAs and uh, mining engineers and so on. So the first thing they tell me is that, Raymond, we have a change of plan. We have, you know, uh, have finished our security background check or whatever. Okay, great. I'm not a terrorist. Yeah, I'm not wanted by any government. Okay, yeah, I've never been to jail. Okay, fine. Okay, good. I, I check out. Yeah, well. We're going to hire another guy to do the mining, and basically you would just shadow. You get to keep your percentage, but you're going to shadow him. Um, okay. Well, they, the team just believes that he's more qualified. I said, oh, okay. So in comes all these questions. I'm talking about questions from everywhere. They bamboozle me with all these questions. So one of the engineers says, uh, he says, I'm not sure we got the right guy for the job. You know, and I don't, I don't say anything. And I'm the only person sitting on the opposite side of the table. By this time, the lawyer, she gets up, who's also 
Mm. So uh, that's another story I'll tell you guys about some other time. <laughs> off, off air. She gets up, she comes to the other side of the table, and she sits down next to me, and she says, "Well, you know, Raymond, we what we what we're having some disagreement with now is that we believe that uh, the other guy serves a better question. I mean, the better to be, better lead the company. So the mind engineer said, "Wait a minute, I don't I don't think so." So I, I think that the guy that we've chosen may be a little bit more outdated and the best man for the job may be sitting right here before us. So they start arguing about that. This is now, this is like about six hours into it. So they pull out all these documents and they said all these documents in front of me for me to sign. So I start looking at the document. I, I'm not sitting there with no attorney. My attorney is, is in Ghana. So I said, well, I would like to send this to my attorney. Well, Raymond, we don't have time for that. You know, the bill closes, blah, blah, blah. we want all this time, we want to release what is called a teaser, we want to release this teaser before the bail closes, and so on and so forth, if we can get this deal done today, you know, this would be a great start, so as I'm going, I'm reading, I said, well, let me read some of this, so I'm reading through it, and I see, I can't, for the life of me, I cannot remember this word, but I remember asking what that word is, let's just say the word, for, for the sake of time, the word is, uh, 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 collude. And I said, uh, I said, collude. I said, uh, uh, does that mean bribe? And the lawyer says, no, Raymond, no, it's not bribe. I said, well, can you explain it to me? Well, collude is basically when when you can offer money to some people to do something, mm-hmm. even if it's outside your normal job role. I said, yeah, I said, bribe. And she says, no, 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 you can't use the word bribe. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> then. One of the CPAs said, well, let me explain it like this. He says, well, you know how when you're in Africa and you're having a hard time getting people to do something and it's better off to just pay them to finish the work? And I said, yeah. I said, we, we, we call that bribe. <laughs> no, 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 it's not bribe. No, you can't say bribe. <laughs> so we go on and on. We go on and on about this for about 30 minutes. So finally, the main guy comes in and the managing director comes in. He says, well, you know, let's, let's give Raymond a break. Let's get something to eat. You know, we, we still have some time before the bill closes to get this deal wrapped up. And then the lawyer, she sits down next to me and she says, I want you to understand something here. She said, you got to learn that there are some terms that you just can't say out loud. I said, what, bribe? She said, yeah, but you can't say that out loud. I said, well, that's what it is. Well, Raymond, you just can't say it out loud. I said, listen to me, lady. I said, let me tell you something. If the president of the United States of America is in Africa and he gets pulled over by the police, he's going to give that police officer something for tea, coffee, or one of his girlfriends or something. I don't give a damn what Secret Service says. I don't care what the world I say. It's just not going to happen. I said, in this country, it may be bribe. Over there, it's called getting stuff done. I said, so you telling me that Wall Street has a word for bribe as long as I don't use bribe? She says, well, basically, yes. I said, okay. So I said, what about if we just say consulting fees? She says, consulting fees. I said, yeah, in Africa, when we don't want to say the word bribe, we just say consulting fees. Can I just say consulting fees? She said, yeah, you can say consulting fees. So when we were talking about the word bribe, even Wall Street has a word for it, but Absolutely. you just can't use the word. Right, right, because bribes are illegal, but if you say consulting fee, then it's the way around it. Yes, yes. And I, I'll never forget, right when I got ready to leave, by the third day, and a uh, couple of visits from her before and after uh, uh, all of this, uh, before and after uh, work hours, she <laughs> she said, uh, one of the things, Jonas and TNT, I don't want people to see me as, let me say this. I don't want people to see me as an angel. Let me just say that to the audience. I do a lot of good, and I know I do a lot of good. But one of the things I've learned about when people see you as an angel and they find out that there's something about you they don't like, they will demonize and turn on you worse than Kobe Bryant and, 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 and everybody else. I don't. I don't want to be seen as the golden boy. I don't want people to think that. I know I'm a guy who do a lot of good stuff. I tell people all the time, I'm the best guy you're going to meet, but I got a few bad habits. So, you know, just uh, just I want to throw that out there. But when we were sitting in that office, the one thing she came over, this is the one thing that really got me. When she came over to me, she sat down next to me, and she did that whole little uh, uh, New York 
uh, executive woman lit crossing thing, and she sat down. She said, "I want you to stop all this bullshit now." I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "This whole country boy, you don't know no better uh, tone. I don't like it." She said, "You done turned forty five minutes into four days, so I don't, I don't want you to, I don't want no more than you to come across as you don't know no better." And you ignorant and you, I said, Hey lady, I ain't never tell you that I wasn't smart. I just told you I was country. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and nothing's wrong with that. Nothing right? wrong at yes. all, man. Wow. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, so an that's an interesting story. I've had three, I didn't go into all the little details, but I've had three times I've had Wall Street want to take me public. Uh, and I probably, I should have probably done it. I probably should have done it. I, I really, would be a lot further along if I had, but I just didn't see it benefiting the village people. Well, and I that opens up I a just, whole other can of worms for you because then you have shareholders you're responsible for as well. Yes. 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 So, you know, then you're responsible to give them profits, and then you're being tugged two directions, you know, from, you know, profit margins for your shareholders and for, you know, the people you support in Africa. And it's, I'm sure it could be a stressful situation if that happened. So. And then, and you know, one of the things I learned about being a private company, too, is you don't have to answer questions if you don't want to. That's the other, that's the other great thing about when you're a public traded company, you know, you, Right, because right now a lot of companies are having to answer questions about not actually having gold. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but uh, there's a very good friend of mine <clears throat> who is considered – he's the opposite of myself. I'm considered the world's greatest gold miner. Where that title came from, I, 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 I would love to say I made it up because if I would have made it up, I would have gave my <laughs> – but um, he's considered the greatest trader in the world. He traded for Goldman Sachs, Citibank. He's a he's a whistleblower. Um, uh, name is Andrew McGuire. You should you guys should look him up. And uh, he and I are supposed to do a show together. He's a uh, man. Anything about trading, this guy is it. As a matter of fact, you know, there's a war. That's a war, literally, fighting going on amongst us miners and the brokers and the and the traders. And it's 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 causing a lot of problems in the gold market right now. It's causing jewelry hikes to go up. That's one of the things that's driving the price up on technology, like the iPhone, all them people talking, why is it $1,000? Because of all the precious metals that they're using inside yeah. these things, the price is rising. And that war is going on between us and them. And uh, somehow or another, he and I have become really close. And that is very unusual for the industry because the miners, I, I, oh, I know the perfect analogy for it. The, the traders or the vampires, and the miners are the lichens, the the, the the werewolves. We're like the workhorses, and the the vampires are like the everybody love and they out front and they kind of, you know they get to do everything, and we are the guys that's in the back digging. But then guys like me came along, and kind of mixed uh, like, like a hybrid, you know. So now the miners don't look so bad because you got Doctor Youngler who can not only go and sit down with a warlord, but also sit down with a central bank governor. And have just a continuing conversation as I do with the warlord about, you know, how to end this war or maybe a government official. Cause I've had this happen to me many times. Government officials would give me messages to take into the bush to the rebels, to the warlords. I've done that many times. And then at the same time, go and sit down with a central bank governor about, uh, how and what we can do to release some of the debt tension on the country or raise the, the, the you know, the GDP or, you know, some, whatever the case may be. But, uh, but yeah, that, you know, with the, with the whole thing that's going on now, the, the miners, the, the small scale gold miners, the small scale silver diamond, all the miners, the small scale miners is really in need of attention because with all that gold and diamonds and silver and things that we're extracting, there's still some of the poorest people on the planet. I, I just can't. I just really can't understand it. I just can't. And no matter how hard I try, no matter what it is, it just seems like I can't win. But now I've, I've kind of saw some light because now what I've realized is that we are no longer uh with people like me and I'm able to do this podcast with you guys and able to talk. A lot of miners can't do that, mainly because some of them 
Let me just be honest. We are not the most educated group. We're definitely not the most sophisticated group. But damn it, we can find that 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 metal and we can we can take it out the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and that, that that brought up a point when you were talking about that. It made me think of so these so these villages in Africa. They give you guys permission to talk to to you know to work on their land and excavate and all of this, like. But you said they're still very poor. Like, do they not get a portion of what you pull out of the ground? Or how does that whole relationship work Be for them to, like, let you, you know, let you let you mine their land, but, you know, then they still are in poverty? Okay. Now, when I mine, that, that poorness is not granted to me because I own the mining company. But then think about it like this. I am... <clears throat> I am one out of 30 million small-scale miners worldwide. So out of every every time you got one of me, that's literally 100,000 that doesn't have my connections and so on. This is one of the reasons why the miners have kind of pushed me to the front to kind of say, hey, Doc, represent us. Yeah, yeah, we we in Namibia. Yeah, we in Togo. Yeah, we in the Congo. Yeah, we in Peru. But you, you can represent us. You, you are the one who can go before you, they won't, okay, let me tell you what the biggest problem is, uh, uh Jones. Just, uh, just look at it like this. On a mining site, there could be 10,000 miners. Literally, 10,000. They have their own city, their own system, their own government, their own laws. This is God on the truth. The central laws won't apply here. Even the president, the vice president, know that they can't come into this mining camp and apply uh, laws and regulations governed by the land. The so, only so time the, you does see the, the mining area is it own its own like sovereign area? Then, like you guys basically can do what you want on it. It's, it's that way because it's just uncharted territory. You're in the middle. You you're not around civilization. Um. You you just you just out there with your own device. You're in the middle of the jungle. You you're nine hours Nobody away from really anything. Owns it. To, okay. Yeah, you know you just in no land. Even though you're in the country, now the only time you really see government try to crack down is when a nation like the United States saying, "Hey, we have terrorists coming out this area, or we have a problem with uh, murdering groups, or." or drugs or something like that. That's the only time you kind of see these places become under observation. Outside of that, I can literally, it's a God and truth, I can take you to places in the jungle where you would see more Indians there from India than you would see Africans. The Africans are doing the mining. The Indians are there with backpacks filled with cash, $2 million, $3 million. And every time the miners bring one gram of gold out the ground, that's normally valued at thirty nine to forty two dollars per gram. The Indians are buying it at fifteen and twenty because the miners haven't processed it yet. All the miners are in deep need of money. So the moment they bring, then the Indians take that gold when they get enough, they run back to their country. Same thing with some Americans and British. They're all doing it. Then you, then this is this is what's going. Or they trade the miners for food. Literally, you trade a twenty dollar bag of rice for forty dollars worth of gold. Uh. Then the miners, this is what's happened. This happened for many years. Then you have somebody like me who comes along, and I'm at this mining camp, and I'm looking at an area right next to it, and I tell the miners, I say, hey, um, for you guys who need to process your gold, somebody told me that y'all selling it to these Russian guys for, for $20. They said, yeah, you know, this is a buyer. He's been buying for a long time. And then my cousin, who's another broker, have, have set us up, you know, because maybe the Russians are giving him five dollars per gram, so he's convinced them to also do it. Then I say, well, I I, I pull out my phone and I pull up a picture that I didn't uh, screenshot. And I say, this is what gold is trading for today. And they're like, so we supposed to get forty dollars? Yeah, you supposed to get forty dollars. I said, but uh, why don't you guys bring it over to my to my camp and I process it for free? You guys ain't got to pay nothing. We'll just run it through. You process it. You can take it to town. You can sell it. Then the miners would say, well, we can't go to town. You know, we, we bush boys, they normally don't go to town. They don't do this. And that's, in, that's how it ends up. Then you got me who come back around and I go and I sit down with the chief and I say, chief, I said, um, you guys are really missing out on a lot of money 
And long story short, we go around and around. This is over some years. Now, this ain't just how it happened in one day. Mm-hmm. It's over some years in the countries. And finally, that's when the, the chiefs and the miners all sit down and say, hey, can you, you know, the chief will say my son. Because when they refer to you as their son, they really mean it. Can you, my son, can you go and represent us? Can you, we have two, 200,000 miners here in this part of the country. Can you represent us? All these miners are working on my land. I can tell these miners that all the gold that they get will come to you. Can you sell it for us on our behalf? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Then it, that chief tells another chief. Then that chief tells another chief. Then that chief tells another mining guy. And that mining guy goes to another one. And before you know it, I, I never forget this argument I had with the United Nations. Me and the United Nations had this big little fight at one time. They kept trying to put the mining numbers at about 15 million. <clears throat> And I told him, I said, I, I remember I did an interview with the United Nations, and I told him, I said, no, the miners are more than 15 million. I said, I personally know 10 million miners. It's not possible you know 10 million. I said, I'm telling you, I personally, over all my years, I have shaken the hands of 10 million miners. I know that for a fact. I can tell you right now, the miners' numbers are at about 50. By the time myself and the United Nations got done fighting, we agreed that the number is between 22 to 30 million. I just saw some new reports that came out here recently that the mining numbers are at 100 million miners worldwide, from Eastern Asia to uh, Africa, South America, the islands, all over the place. You oh, have wow. these miners. Yeah, it's it's a big, it's a very big thing. So, and the respect for the miners, it really has just started coming. It has. It wasn't like how it is before. Because people literally, the first thing people think is, oh, he's a scam artist. And I tell people all the time, they say, those emails I get, are they real? I say, yeah, some of them actually are real. Wow, wow, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, some of them are real. I said, but where you got to go to get that gold what these guys are talking about, I promise you that you you probably need somebody like me to go with you or you need a small little force to go in there with you because there's no way you would be able to go in there and, and something not happen to you. You ain't going to have no problem with the miners. Because the miners want you to come. They want you to invest. They want equipment. They want better life. They want to kids send their kids to good schools. They want to they want to have buy nice things for their wives. They want electricity. You're not going to have a problem with the miners. You're going to have a problem going in there with the cash because the miners are not going to accept nothing else except cash. And you're going to have a problem coming out with the gold because the, every bandit know you went into that jungle knowing that you went there and bought something from the miners and they know it's gold and they know you got to come out with it, whether it's gold or diamonds or whatever. So the chances that you're going to make your flight, you're not. So what has happened is you see a lot of the countries, a lot of the brokers literally go in groups and they set up camps and they're in the jungle by the, oh man, I, oh, it's, it's so many of them sometimes you, you don't even know, you, know, you think you're in a whole new city. They created a whole new life. Huh. It's crazy. Wow, that's yeah, crazy. Uh, well, right, well, I mean, it's good that, that I mean, from what you, from what, the way you're speaking, I mean, like, it seems like you aren't the typical miner. You know what I mean? You you fight for the villagers, you fight for the people to. It's a philanthropist, right? Right. So that's all right here in this bio. Well, right, and, and you know, and no wonder they wanted you to be, you know, the, you know, to to elect you as like their paramount chief, or you know, because you show you're so much different than everyone else that goes in there, probably. You know, and you show them that you care and that you actually want them to get better, so they appreciate that. You know, I mean, I can assume that that's probably, you know, it's like a brush of fresh, fresh air for them because you're not there just taking the resources, trying to do whatever like some of them are. You know. Yeah, and 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 it, and, it, and the miners, you know, we like I said, we're kind of Neanderthal. We we are old. We are we are we are a dying source that has just now become pertinent again. Because I, I learned this from Andrew. I never knew this. I remember one conversation I had with Andrew, and I told him I Andrew McGuire from he's from London, the the gold trader, the Goldman Sachs gold trader I was telling you about. I asked him. I said, Andrew. I said, man. I said I gotta ask this question. He gave me a whole lot of things to talk about, you know, to think about. And I said, Andrew. I said, uh, I gotta ask this question. I said, I've made a lot of bad decisions over the years, man. I said, I bought a lot of mining property. And I hold a lot of property worldwide, millions of acres I hold worldwide. You know, I said, and I've had some people who died from on from me getting that land from us mining. I'm pushing my people to 
to literally to their death trying to trying to lift us to a whole nother spectrum. I said, I gotta ask, why is it that every time I buy mining property and my property is grams per ton better than the big mining company who's trading on the stock exchange? Now, granted, they got more land than I got, but my property percentage wise, I'm supposed to be catching them percentage. I may not catch them in volume, but I'm damn so supposed to catch them in percentage. Why is it that no matter how good a number I report, they number always top my numbers? And one of the things he told me was, because you actually mining. I said, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. He said, you're actually mining. You're actually extracting. You're actually in there digging. He said, most of these companies are just making this crap up. Then he tells this story. He, he even tells it on an interview with the History Channel and everywhere else. He tells this story about how the the, the banks and the, all these people are colluding together to fraud the, uh, the mining, the gold industry. And one of the things he said to me that, that, I mean, when I tell you I was speechless, even now I get queasy in the stomach when I think about how he explained it to me. For every 10,000 kilograms of silver that's actually traded on the stock exchanges and the, and the gold and the precious metal exchanges, that's only one actual real kilogram that exists. Yeah, for I every believe 5, that. For every 5,000 kilograms, TNT, for every 5,000 kilograms of gold, that's only one that exists. So he told me, he said, the chances are that the gold that you guys are extracting is maybe a good chance that that's the only gold that really does exist. The rest of it is in certificates, is in storage, per se, is in all this other stuff that's paper. Oh. Or made up out the air. Wow. And he said, your, he said that your U.S. State Department knows this. He knows, they know this because I, not only did I tell them, I showed them how it's done. When I was still working for the banks. And if, if he, if, if that lawsuit that is under, that's pending now, if it goes through, because the numbers that I've been hearing is six, uh, anywhere between seven to seventeen trillion dollars in fraud from the gold and silver. If it goes through, it will be the largest lawsuit ever existing in our time ever. Wow. There's nothing that we even come with. And it I probably, remember sitting there. It would probably have a, a detrimental effect to our economy as well, right? Yes. Yes. Because they, I, I remember when I was speaking. I was speaking to the lawyer, guys. I was speaking to the lawyer. Andrew called me one day. He said, Raymond, I want you to talk to the lawyers that's uh, hitting this lawsuit. And I, you know, and I said, okay. When the lawyers first came on the call, I promised to. They were treating me like a, I would normally say a redheaded step, step child with freckles. <laughs> but no, they, they, they were treat the, Jonas, they would treat me like a black guy from Louisiana, deep in the South. They, they, I, I got no so Okay. And, um, uh, about 30, the, the, the head lawyer came on. He said, well, you know, I only got 15 minutes for this call, and, you know, he wanted to rush off the phone. And so I didn't say anything. So finally, when everybody got through saying their little spiel, Andrew came, and he said, oh, Raymond, uh, can you please explain to these guys, you know, this or that and so on? Shit. About two hours later, you think the head guy's off the phone? Because I told they were going down the wrong road with the lawsuit. They, they didn't even understand the minor's point of it. They didn't even, all this stuff about how they were doing it. So then I started realizing that there's a, a very big disconnect between the miners and everybody else. Nobody really understands what's going on. And if we had time, I would tell you guys this, this story about even when I first learned how important I was. Maybe at another time we can do that. But it is a very big disconnect. And right now, the miners really, really, how can I say this? They really, really need to connect directly with people. You, you know, uh, but yeah, that's enough. So we'll get into that. It sounds, it sounds like you're the man to do it, though, right yeah, now, absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. Well, yeah. I thought well, you don't have enough responsibility already. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, I think we, that we should probably wrap it up about there. We got a lot of good stuff today, man. I'll tell you what, I didn't know what to expect from the interview, and it pretty much blew any expectation I had out of, yeah. out of the water, man. I, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I think down the road we probably will have you back on again, like just to get into more stories and more stuff about this. It's been, it's been awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> 
No how problem, do you how, how, how do you call, how do you say I have more money than you in in Nigerian? <laughs> can, <laughs> can, can you give me that All one? Right, that, 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 in Nigeria, they got like 30, 40, no more than that, about 200 languages, man. So Whichever I don't know one. which one. All right. Well, <laughs> well, no, but I'm not Nigerian. I'm American now. Uh, you don't, You speak a little African. You have to, right? Or did you have a translator? No, I, no, I, have, I have a – oh, I have a shitload of translators. Oh. Uh, I can tell you – I can tell you in Louisiana terms, we can say I'm all right. I'm all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> oh, my I'll God, it's rich. <laughs> it's rich. That's what that means. I know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> oh, man. Well, before we wrap everything up, today, you want to tell everybody again where they can find your website and on Twitter and everything so we can uh, make sure they can check you out? Yes, yes. My website is uh, www.youngbloodindustries.com. Go on there. Don't expect to read a lot. We have, we, we're trying to modernize, you know, we, we, we old school miners. We're trying to modernize. We do a lot with the videos now to kind of show people what we're doing instead of people having to read a lot because everything is going mobile and nobody has time to read anymore. So www.youngbloodindustries.com. Uh, Twitter is, uh, at Dr. Youngblood, D-R-Y-O-U-N-G-B-L-O-O-D. Facebook is Raymond Youngblood Jr. Uh, Google Plus is, uh, I think it's, uh, Dr. Raymond Youngblood Jr., Dr. Raymond Youngblood, that's how it sounds, Jr., Jr., and pretty much that's how you can find. If you, if you have a hard time finding anything, just Google Dr. Raymond Youngblood Jr., I think some, some stuff will pop up. Send me a friend request on Facebook or Twitter, whatever, you know, and, you know, learn about what we're doing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. We really, really appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. No, this was awesome, man. You guys are great. I, I, I didn't know what to expect either. Some of the shows I heard, I told my staff, I said, what in the hell y'all done got me into? But, uh, <laughs> this has been great. I swear it's been great. Awesome. More better than what I, what I can ever do. Yeah, I swear. It's that's, a wonderful conversation. That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, we'll be right back on the Crazy Town podcast after this quick break. TNT. Dr. Raymond Youngblood had some fucking stories. Yeah, man. yeah. And I'm on the fence. I'm back on the fence. I told you that. <laughs> All right, well. I just don't know what to believe anymore. Man, man, international man of mystery. There's been some development since this taping. I'm not going to divulge because we are not being compensated to divulge anything. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm on the fence again. So there. <laughs> You're so funny. You're on the fence, too, now. Everybody's a fence. Are you on the fence now? You're back on the fence. I like fences. <laughs> Get up here. It's plenty of room on the fence. <laughs> here, put one of these fence spikes. Sit right down on it. It's barbed wire. You know, it'll catch you on the way over. Next season, episode three, we do everything from the fence. <laughs> the third season, we're going to be live on a fence. All right. Make sure you follow us on Twitch, uh, Crazy Town, twitch.tv forward slash Crazy Town Media. Uh, also, YouTube channel is under Crazy Town Media. Make sure you subscribe there and follow us on Twitter at Crazy Town Media. Next interview volume, has, it's a three spot. Ooh. Darren Pfeiffer, a goldfinger. Ooh. PJ Stover, stunt woman and radio host. Mm -hmm. And Kay Cutter from Ink Master. Oh. The, the trifecta. Yeah, I know. The best ones, right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> for Jonas. Not on the fence for any of yeah. those. <laughs> <laughs> for Jonas, for TNT Dynamite, we are out. <laughs>